Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, myself, Nikhil V. Chandran. I'm uh, the organizer of the Hyperlogic Cochimita group. Today, uh, we are here at uh, IIITMK building at uh, K KBA. And we, will, we are organizing the offline meetup here. So today, we have with us our guest, uh, Mr. Sunit Bendre who's having 11 years of experience in the industry and having a strong hold on enterprise and tech stack technologies and the blockchain stack. Uh, Mr. Mendre has led projects in various domains like telecommunication, payments, wealth management, enterprise architecture, and blockchain. He is currently working as technical architect in Ironwork Technologies, where he drives end-to-end -end blockchain products right from the early stage of ideation to production grade product. Also, we have uh, Ms. Anusha Garg, who is having four years experience in blockchain. Uh, she has worked from the platform level to the cryptocurrency exchanges. She has been associated with uh, KBA before. She has keen interest in design and research and development activities. With this, she also likes to experiment and play around with uh, new challenges. So uh, I would like to hand over uh, this, the control to Mr. Sunit and Ms. Anusha to present on say, uh, say no to centrally controlled identity, uh, which uh, they will be presenting uh, to you all guys. So thank you everyone and welcome Mr. Sunit and Ms. Anish. Thank you. Thanks Nikhil. Uh, so we'll get Thanks, Thanks. Nikhil. And then again, speak on this one. Yes. If you put a silver speaker. Um, okay, no, I think it is good. Can you speak? Yes, yeah, it's not getting good. Okay. What is it? And yeah. Okay, so we'll get started. Thanks, Nikhil. So today we'll cover on the uh, topic, which is say no to centralized controlled uh, identity. And we'll, we'll quickly uh, go through what is identity, the use case, uh, and one demo as well. So I'll hand over to Anusha to take the initial content. Yeah, so hi. So uh, discussing about identity first. So what is identity to you people? Identity for us is a combination of our biometrics, what we represent and our demographics. So biometric as in our fingerprint, our iris scans, et cetera. Demographics as in my name, my age, where I live at, et cetera. And what I represent as in maybe my bank account statements, et cetera. So these are what constitute my identity. So, uh, so this is like something which is personal to me, right? So identity today has been st structured into three um, formats. First is a centralized identity or the siloed identity. So what do we mean by centralized identity or the siloed identity? That is that my data is being controlled at a centrally located server. So for example, I get my driving license or my Aadhaar or my bank account information from a centrally controlled server where my data is kept and I'm just accessing that data through various devices, right? So that is one. Second is a third party or a federated identity system. That is when I am using a third party to log in into a system. So suppose I use Google Auth, I use uh, sign in with Facebook, et cetera. So that in that case, I uh, let the third party provider authorize for me or log in for me. So that is the second kind of identity that I'm using. So the problems with these two systems, prevalent systems or uh, uh, most commonly available systems is 
that first wish over sharing our information. Like, for example, if I'm signing in with Facebook, then Facebook knows that I've signed in with some other website. The website can use the data from Facebook. Facebook can use data from this website. But did I authorize it? No, I did not. Second, central storage. They have a central storage for management. And so that becomes a central point of attack, easy to uh, a blocker, because if the service at this central storage dies, then our data is... Uh, in not in you know safe hands then only human readable and verification services so if i have a hardware copy of my aadhar card what is the verification process a person only sees my aadhar card and says it's okay right or i need to go through a rigorous uh, verification process of getting it scanned and you know check the aadhar number checked etc but that also only some people will have access to this model and you know they can only check not everybody can then identity spoofing this is something that uh, is, you know, we all have been facing that our identity is being used on various social medias without our consent at different places. Uh, we have our IDs, you know, that we don't even know my faces with some other name existing on some social media website, etc. So identity spoofing is very common. People are, I don't still don't know who is using my phone number for some connection that he's having. So these things are prevalent and we know it. Tampering of the document, our documents, we can we easily tamper with our documents. How many of us have not tampered with COVID, uh, COVID documents? So many people have, you know, tampered driving licenses, etc. So this is a truth that we can easily tamper with these documents. Security is compromised. I lose a hardware document or a paper document and I lose it. Then secondly, if somebody gets access to it, they get access to the full document. So security is compromised. Forgery, anybody can forge our documents. So forgery is there. Then there is a data bridge, right? So how this data is getting, you know, transferred, how this data is getting shared. So this data bridge is also a very big shortcoming. Now uh, for this, I'll also cite an example. So suppose I, my, one of the aspects of my identity is my bank statement, if I'll say. So what my bank statement does is, if tomorrow I go for an admission to, uh, I go, I take my kid and I take him to a school and I go for admission, the school records ask me for the, my whole statement. What do they want to know? They only want to know my salary, right? But what am I giving them? I'm giving them full um, description of how, what transactions did I make? Where did I make these transactions? Who, when did these transactions get processed? What was the amount? But why, why should I share so much of information? They only need a proof that my salary is this much, right? I'm oversharing the information. This information will get stored in their system. They can reshare it, why? I am not giving them access, but they have information, they can share it. There, uh, this information, they are, you know, verifying it in human readable form. They can spoof it. They can, like, if they're sharing it, they can spoof it as well. So this is a security compromise that we've made with these systems and we are working with it. So we came up, uh, so then decentralized identity came up, which wanted to solve these issues, these trivial issues. So what did decentralized identity say? That there will be three actors in our system, that is the issuer, the holder and verifier, wherein the control of an identity document once issued lies only with the holder. Holder is the king. Holder is the one whom the verify needs to approach who, for verifications. And that also, if the holder only consents to, can, you know, uh, get the verification. So moving from uh, explaining about self-sovereign identity or what self-sovereign identity is, so self-sovereign identity system gives you the ability to use your digital wallet and authenticate your own identity using the credentials that have been issued to you. So basically something like I get a credential of my own. So I get my Aadhaar card. It exists on my mobile wallet. And if tomorrow I want to share some specific information about me to some other organization, I use this Aadhaar card to share my information. And I can also judge like what information they need and i'll not share the entire thing i'll request them to share ask me only for the information that is required and i'll provide proof for only that if they need my name i'll provide a proof for only my name if they need my age and a proof of only my age or an address then an address 
everything is not required per se. You no longer have to give up control of your personal information to dozens of databases. So if I am providing, which essentially means if I am providing a proof that does not exist persistently on that with that verifier, once the proof is done, the proof is done. The data exists with me. He does not get the access to my data that he can share further. Each time you want to access goods and services, the risk of your identity being stolen by hackers. Decentralized identity and verifiable credentials plus SSI empowers us to receive digitally signed credentials, store them in our private wallets and secure, securely prove our online identity. So basically my credentials lie in my uh, wallet on my phone device, which is secured by my private keys and public keys. And I can verify myself by sharing these cryptographically signed documents to the verifiers. So coming to the very important concept of DIDs. So what is a DID? Essentially, a wallet is a composition we know of a public key, a private key, and an attached storage with it, which stores your cryptocurrency, et cetera. For example, if today in my MetaMask, I have 10 ethers, then with the same public key and the same private key, I go to MEW or some other wallet, I still have 10 ethers in that account. It is available everywhere, right? So similarly, similarly, did. Where did did come from? It's coming from the same public private key pair that we are generating. But in here, we're using different algorithms, not necessarily SecP that we use. We also use ED25519, et cetera, for our key generation algorithms. So once we've generated a public private key pair, we convert the public key into a did. Like, so did is a global identifier, just like our public key. And this did has a corresponding did document, which in which we define who the controller of this did is, which algorithm was used to generate this did, which network was used to generate this did, where did this did get the generation or which is the service endpoint where you can you know use this did. This we publish on the ledger. That is, uh, so in Ethereum world, if you'll say, I have an account of public and private key. Once I do a transaction, it gets uh, recognition on the network, right? That this account has these many coins. Similarly here, we make a transaction and we make the DID public. That is, we write that uh, DID with a DID document, with its corresponding DID document on a ledger to just state our identity or publicly reveal our identity. And what is our identity? It's just a identifier, a did, which you cannot relate to my name, right? So the did is persistent. It cannot be changed. It is cryptographically verifiable, as in if I'm generating it by uh, some al algorithm, it is you can verify it. Then the, it is decentralized. There is no central authority controlling it. Today, you can go to any reg did registrar. You can find uh, from W3C a, did, a universal did registrar. Go there, make your did, publish it. Nobody is concerned. You can do it on your own. Resolvable. So if today I tell you that this is my did or this is my identifier, you can again go to a unit resolver, put that did identifier there. You'll get information or the did doc associated to it that where was this, uh, which will tell you that who is the controller or who is the public key for the did, who, which network this did was generated and which was the endpoint. And when was this did last updated? So these things you can get. So that means that the did is persistent, available, cryptographically verifiable, decentralized, and resolvable. So your identifier that is available everywhere, but you are not. I, you, but it does not relate to your personal information. Going to the concept of VCs now, and then connecting them both. So what are VCs? So uh, we see that nothing but credentials, but they are cryptographically verified or signed documents that are stored on your digital SSI wallets. So if you'll see an example here, we have a Maharashtra State Motor Driving License. So in here, what is, what is the credential metadata? So credential metadata here is when the, uh, the driving license number, the dates uh of you know dates of issuing and uh, dates of your vehicle etc these are the credential metadata now what are the claims that the driving license makes the driving license can make a claim that this is your age this is your name this is your surname and this is your address so that is somewhat your claim so claim as in if tomorrow i 
uh, provide a driving license to somebody telling them that I am this person, then these are my claims. So my name is my claim. My surname is my claim. My birth date is my claim. What is the proof? The proof is the signature of the issuing authority. Here, uh, if you can check here, there is a signing uh, and ID of the issuing authority. So that is the proof, right? Now, connecting it with a decentralized identifier. So basically, this credential will be issued to me by uh, the State Motor Driving License Association only or the RTOs. There, they will sign this document using their private key right, corresponding to their data, right? Now, if I have to give this driving license for verification, maybe while buying a car or, you know, uh, giving my age proof to somebody, they will send this request. They will check that if I am of a certain age and above or do I have a driving license, they'll send me a proof request. This proof request will check if it is coming from a verified issuer or not. Using that did they can check that it is coming from the correct issuer or the RTO, Maharashtra RTO. And then they can give me a verification. Yes, I have a driving license and my age is above 18. So that's how things work in the SSI world, wherein people did not get my information. They did not get my ID card, but they got to prove that I am uh, you know, a valid driver. I have a driving, valid driving license and I also have a va valid date of birth that, all right, or age. So that is how things are working here. So I'll hand over the mic to Sunit so that he can proceed with the, okay, sorry. Uh, there's one thing left. So there are 10 principles or core principles of SSI, which were you know designed to overcome the pitfalls of the existing system. So what does SSI say? That uh, whatever we see has been assured to us should be existent everywhere. I should have existence of my driving license in Maharashtra, Kerala, uh, Madhya Pradesh, everywhere. I should be the sole controller of it. I should have, uh, it should exist everywhere and I should be able to access it as well, right? Uh, wherever on whichever device I want to go, it should be accessible. It should be transparent. That is the way it was issued should be transparent to me. The process should be transparent to me. It should be persistent. That is, it should not be changing from you know uh, from uh, geog one geographic lo location to another it should be persistent or i cannot change it if i want to change it it goes as a separate transaction on the ledger portability i can take it from one device to another so that portability should be there protection it should be protected by some mechanism here we are using cryptography to protect all our data interoperability it should be interoperable uh, like it should be you know globally acceptable interoperable it can also travel from ledgers to ledgers, etc. Consent, that is a very important word that we use in SSI, consent. So like I mentioned, if, I, if my data needs to be shared with somebody, I should be the one consenting to it, not some third party. That is, if tomorrow I need to, uh, you know, I need to, uh, my data is required for uh, some research, then I should consent to it, not some third party agency who had previously taken my data. For example, if I open a bank account, I provided them my phone number, I did a KYC, I gave them my address. That does not authorize the bank to share my data for research, right? If they want to share my data for research, the research company should come to me and ask for my consent. That are you consenting for us to use your data? then only they can get my data to share. And minimalization, that means that I should get an option to share minimal data. I am not required to share my whole ID card or all the data points on my ID card. If the required authority needs minimal data, for example, the school requires my only my salary proof, then they should get only that much. They should not get my transactions, my address, etc. They need my salary proof, they should only get that much. So that is what minimalization means. Moving on, we have the trust triangle and Sunit will take over. Uh, thanks, Anusha. So uh, before uh, before we move on to the how, uh, we already understood the concept of SSI. We'll dive more into detail how those are achieved. But I would like to give uh, a thought and uh, I think everyone should uh, give a thought uh, on their day-to-day -day basis with these core principles. So keep in mind some of these core principles uh, 
few are more from a technical point of view, but few are from a day-to-day -day point of view. So on daily basis, give a thought, are you, uh, are you, are your documents following these principles? For example, bank, uh, bank statement, which Anush already mentioned, uh, do you have consent uh, to share the data? Do you have control of that data? Uh, is it getting shared? Same goes with other use cases. For example, your, uh, your social media data. Do you have control of your social media data? Do you provide that uh, consent whenever that data is getting shared with third party? Uh, social media content is, is one of the area. Your, your bank statement, your uh, credit card details. Um, and uh, so you should keep in mind uh, and, and try to adhere to these principles. Right. Moving on uh, to the uh, how, how underline this can be achieved on the SSI side. So uh, this is a very basic triangle from an SSI point of view. Uh, and there are three stakeholders uh, in the SSI ecosystem. One which is on, on the center is the holder. So uh, holder is nothing but individuals who owns the data. Uh, so all individuals. Uh, have their own data. So here, uh, holder will have a mobile device which will consist of an SSI wallet. That particular wallet will have will hold the details. And as as Anusha mentioned, the the mobile device SSI wallet will also have the uh, public public key or public uh, and private key uh, details on the device, which is again asymmetric key what we are using. So all those credentials and data would be available with you, not with any other third party servers. In, in the current system, we are storing all our data to the third party servers, but with this use case or with the SSI, you will hold all your data on your device. So you control uh, it. And because you hold everything on your device, you are also providing consent when that data is getting shared or used by any other uh, means. So coming to the left side, which is the issuer side. So nowadays uh, in web two or with the current day to day activities, you might be aware that there is some issuer who is issuing your documents, uh, be it identity documents or some, some documents which represents uh, yourself. So for example, you get a driving license from uh, let's say transport department, uh, RTOs. Uh, you get passport from passport department. You get uh, your degree certificates from universities. So there are some trusted entities, trusted issuers who are going to issue the uh, verifiable credentials or document. That is what the left uh, uh, part of uh, or the block represents. Coming to the right hand side, the verifier. Once the document is issued to you, once the VC is available with you, without reaching to that particular issuer, we should able to verify the, uh, the document what we are having it. Uh, the verification can be the information which is, uh, which is which comprise in your VC, that data should get verified. For example, when you go to a bank for an uh, account opening, when the KYC is done, the name, address, details need to be verified. The claim or the subject need to be verified, asserted. Similarly, this verifier can look at uh, some of the information from your VC. Not all, whatever is requested, only that information will be accessed by the verifier. So the verifier will play a role out here. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, there is one more layer, which is verifiable data registry. That's nothing but a, a, a DLT or the ledger, what we can say. Currently, if you can, if you take an example, when we open any website, which has an HTTPS uh, behind the scenes, it's our digital certificate. And if, if you look at those certificate, those are issued by some central trusted CAs, root CAs and CAs. Again, we have to rely on those uh, certificates which are issued by some of the central entities. Here, when the when the blockchain ledger comes in place, the issuer is going to publish their did and did document, which was explained a few minutes ago, uh, on this particular ledger, which means you, uh, the issuer's public key would be accessible to anyone uh, who, who wants to read it. And when the verifier is uh, trying to access the data which is available from your side, the verifier can pick up the public key from the ledger and check the verification, which is a cryptographic verification. So verifier is also uh, getting a trust that the data which you're trying to represent uh, to a verifier is issued by a trusted entity. I'm not showing the data created by my own, but 
it is actually been issued by let's say rto passport office or or xyz uh, trusted entities so this is a basic uh, basic uh, ssi concept uh, uh, and stakeholders which play a role now let's move to uh, a use case so uh, uh, from an ironworks point of view a lot of a uh, lot of use case has been implemented across the world but this year uh, this year we were privileged to implement one of the uh, use case uh, for the uh, for the european consortium and uh, that that the european consortium consist of uh, consist of some of the government entities states as well as some of the private companies from the europe so that this particular uh, uh, what i am trying to uh, give a use case here is available in public domain so we can you can go through the source code their concept their idea uh, on the github so that is what we'll quickly touch upon so uh, the concept uh, on the gaix or the europe ecosystem is that they want to create a identity uh, layer so as uh, if you if you think a little bit more deeper on the internet side internet does not have an identity layer altogether on its own internet is mainly meant to exchange the data uh, across entities so they do not identify or they do not they do not trust that information uh, as an architecture of an internet that's where we we uh, from an ssi point of view are adding an identity layer on top of the internet which is a data exchange layer so once the identity is there available based on this identity layer we can trust the entities who are exchanging the data we know with whom we are exchanging the data and who is reading our data and so on and so forth so that that adds the trust uh, layer and identity layer on top of the internet post that as soon as we have an identity and the data transfer uh, or the data exchange layers now the services and the data uh, can can be on top of this so now the end users individuals can leverage the services companies can uh, provide the services uh, make their services available for subscription and in trusted manner uh, the ecosystem can uh, can play a big role and it would be very easy faster for uh, all the all the major stakeholders to run their businesses and that's where the complete ecosystem will come in place uh, so gaix mainly is uh, is again uh, trying to keep uh, on the principles of decentralization so they, they the complete architecture is based on the principle of decentralization and with this uh, architecture the users will control the data on their own devices and they can also trust the other entities uh, depending on the uh, uh, based on the identity let's move more on then uh, uh, on very high level architect uh, this is uh, this is the hierarchy of the uh, uh, overall solution because this comes with an uh, federated as well as a decentralized format i'll explain you that so for example uh, at, at one layer they are doing a federation so first module uh, the block what you see it's uh, more of a government entity where they have a consortium a group of company or an government institute who is going to issue the initial level of uh, vcs to the companies who are getting onboarded they also have the governance um, now um, as as the citizens or the business of any xyz uh, countries we have to adhere to some of the governance which are uh, in, uh, available in place so these governance will be uh, will be will be implemented or will be uh, all the companies will have to adhere to it for example let's say in india uh, if any company getting registered with mca they have to get registered they will receive a uh, incorporation certificate and they then only they can start their business similarly in europe they have their uh, governance policies they have to have some registration with the government entities only this set of federation would be uh, would be available with the companies so as soon as the companies are onboarded and the, these each individual will act as an issuer or verify what we saw in a previous slide so once the company is onboarded let's say somebody getting onboarded as a national id uh, provider some banks will get onboarded uh, employers companies will get onboarded as soon as they get onboarded they would receive a uh, verifiable credentials um, in their own wallet and they will act as a issuer or verifier in that case so vc is nothing but after the uh, after the after they meet the governance uh, uh, 
policies and rules and uh, accordingly and with the gaix we have implemented this governance policy with the rego programming language uh, so these programming uh, so these rego policies will get executed in each of the flows uh, as they are in place and once they have the vc now they now these will act as an independent or they will act as a decentralized uh, uh, in, in decentralized behavior so federation is done for each of the organization now they will act as a decentralized format which means they will work independently with the end users uh, same goes with bank employer and each will also have their own trust registry trust registry is nothing but again a governance model so for example uh, nascom will put you some or rbi will give you some governance policies at, at a very high level for the banks and then each bank will have to um, add their own governance uh, or own policies at their own uh, respectively similarly they can implement on their own that's where each will act as a decentralized format and um, here the third layer which is a mobile device they, those are nothing but the end users uh, those are the ssi wallet they can connect to the respective uh, organizations and uh, exchange or subscribe to the services the good part here is um, as organizations have a vc with them um, and we saw the there is an issuer verifier and also a holder so each uh, holder can also do a verification of the organizations uh, in that case so many times we come across in a situation where the fraud companies there and after few subscription transactions we are not able to uh, do the uh, appropriate transactions later on that can be avoided to some extent because initially uh, at very early stage you can do a verification of that company or an institute uh, and once the verification is done you know they have met some of the governance policy and uh, henceforth and then you can trust to better extent uh, moving on to the architecture um, of this uh, complete system though this is still and very abstracted uh, architecture what we want to represent otherwise it would be a too much elaborated one but coming uh, to uh, to the uh, basic architecture a trust registry what we uh, just had a discussion uh, it's a governance policy uh, uh, add, uh, written in a rego programming language so you can add these uh, you can write these policies what policies to be met on each of the transactions uh, the central part is the uh, organization credential manager so the, the blue box what we saw as an organization institute this will be an independent uh, entity uh, which will act in decentralized format and it will consist of its own wallet which means uh, a, a cloud wallet which means they will have their own public key private key they will also receive the vc from an uh, federated system or the governance uh, institutes uh, the central part which plays an important role uh, afj is nothing but an hyperledger uh, aries javascript framework that's the framework uh, getting used uh, for uh, uh, to act as an issuer or a verifier on the blockchain side and then some of the microservices are available to uh, to have the scale and uh, handle the responsibilities uh, in the complete ecosystem Coming to the uh, left hand side, we have an actor which is nothing but an end user who holds the uh, personal credential manager and this personal credential manager is nothing but your mobile device. Okay? And uh, there is a portal marketplace available so, uh, so any any user can uh, log into a website marketplace portal uh, provided by the XYZ Institute and they can leverage the services. For example, any wealth management service uh, companies want to uh, provide their service on the portal. So end user can look at the service, subscribe to the services. As soon as they subscribe to a services, they will receive a verifiable credential that they was, you are subscribed to so and so service for X Y Z duration and detail more details around it. And the company is also uh, in a way uh, trusting the individuals because uh, all the individuals have to prove their national ID uh, uh, before before those are getting subscribed. So we know these are the legitimate uh, users. These are not the default users and X Y Z uh, details. So the company also get to some level of trust before before they uh, issue the subscription to any individuals. Authentication authorizations and mediator uh, about the mobile notification. These are some of the modules which uh, are available out here. Though we have not represented here the ledger, uh, indie ledgers and other things, but again, an abstracted way what we wanted to represent. 
So uh, let's move on to the demo part. Uh, and uh, the use case is that uh, here we are going to deal with three verifiable credentials. One is a national ID. Uh, second is a, a vaccination certificate. And third is a railway ticket. So uh, by default, the national ID would should be there with in all, all individuals so that they can represent uh, themselves uh, to any subscription um, uh, issuer or a provider so that's where the digital identity will play a role then we have vaccination because uh, we have just uh, gone through a, a big uh, big let's say pandemic which is a covid and that's where the vaccination and we knew that uh, uh, know that vaccination certificate is required uh, or to do any reservation or a, or a travel or a public appearance that's where uh, in this use case we have uh, kept the vaccination certificate mandatory and then the railway ticket uh, would be issued to individual so we'll walk through the demo right now Okay, so on the right hand side, uh, this is uh, this is the mobile screen what we are uh, what we are sharing here, and this mobile screen what you see is a Adaya wallet which is developed by Ironworks and Blockstar. So this is nothing but an uh, SSI uh, wallet. So the, the the one what you saw holder and the uh, corresponding block uh, in the triangle is is nothing but a technical representation out here. This is an app. Uh, SSI wallet, it consists of public private did uh, certificates available inside the wallet and it also have storage which holds the ver uh, verifiable credentials. On the left hand side, we have uh, a, a demo uh, page where we are going to represent the railway and the second use case we are also going to represent in passwordless login. So we'll talk about that. So on the mobile side, we'll quickly go and uh, register ourselves. So creating wallet uh, is nothing but you're creating the did and did document, creating the public private key with all the uh, all the uh, cryptographic and uh, and encryption algorithms behind the scenes. Here we are again using an AFJ or Aries JavaScript framework hyperledger uh, from a mobile uh, SDK point of view as well. Okay, uh, I'm just getting started. Uh, okay, so here there are a few more use cases, but right now we'll go with the railway. Later on, this is uh, again on an, our production side, so you can also try on your own. Okay, so I'll just get the national ID, what I mentioned, the first identifier. So this scan, what we did right now is basically we are connecting to the national ID provider. We are connecting to one of the institute and this connection is nothing but a peer to peer connection. So when we say peer to peer in decentralized format, we do not have to create account or store the our details with them, but we are just connect, making a temporary connection again, exchanging the public private keys to do the operations. We can disconnect our connection if we want to discontinue the further communication. But still, even after this discontinuation, uh, if the VCs are available with our wallet, those are still uh, uh, used and verifiable uh, throughout, uh, throughout the app. Uh, okay, connection is made. Uh, you can see a did, which is again, uh, uh, did and uh, details available. Let's get the uh, national ID. I'll say uh, for now, it's a demo we'll say right now. So we have added few details out here, but uh, you can also use uh, some of the uh, other uh, information. Okay, uh, so right now on the mobile, we have received the details which were added as a national ID. So we have right now generated a random number for a national ID and uh, we have to accept uh, this particular VC. We are accepting it. And if you view, see the details, now the VC is available in our wallet. Going back and now we can see uh, there's one VC available in our 
credential. So one VC is available. And right now we just entered few details and uh, got the VC, but uh, at least in India uh, with uh, Aadhaar card, we have an XML format. So that XML format can also be used and uh, uh, issue the other details or issue the VC from, from an Aadhaar card database. And similarly, there can be X, Y, Z, or there can be a, a multiple sources to get these respective VCs. Now, after the national ID is there, let's take the vaccination certificate here. Again, as we go ahead and want to request for vaccination certificate, our primary identity very, uh, VC should be available in place uh, to receive the vaccination. So we do not, uh, so here, because of we have an identity document or VC, uh, we, are, uh, we are making sure that we, uh, issue the vaccination certificate to the same individual uh, without getting tampered the data within within the flow. So here we do not have to enter our details, but the vaccination certificate would be issued to the same individual. Uh, and here the proof request which is uh, given. So if you see. Uh, we received the, the ID, national ID with these details. And now we are sharing this information to the uh, health institute or the vaccination institute uh, so that they can fetch this information. They can verify that I hold this uh, VC with me and then the vaccination certificate will be issued uh, to, to my wallet. If, if I fail the verification, the vaccination will not be issued to me. So I cannot modify these details because these are picked from the uh, these are picked from the uh, ident uh, national ID, which was which proof was given from my side. Basically, I shared the details with the institute. These are the details, a uh, few of the dummy details what we have given or randomly generated, uh, and we accept the VC on our side. So this we are accepting the very vaccination certificate in our wallet. Okay, now we have received, uh, we can see it. And here now we can see that there are two uh, VCs available with us, uh, digital national ID and the vaccination certificate. Now going to a railway booking, though this, this uh, use case is curated with all these basic VCs, but you can have your customization uh, based on the flow you want to achieve and the VC sequence you want to make it. Now let's go ahead and take the railway ticket uh, Again, we are scanning and making in connection uh, because uh, here uh, now we are making a connection with an railway institute or a railway reservation center to receive a ticket. As I mentioned, the prerequisite will, will be vaccination certificate out here. So railway is asking me to prove the vaccination certificate, which I have once that VC is provided. So here, uh, Whenever we, we uh, where proof request is asked and we say send, basically uh, institute is asking me the data, but the data will be shared only when the consent is provided from my side. So if you look at those principles, consent is handled out here. So without my consent, the data will not be shared to any other institute. Now, even the railway institute, I share the details with them. They are not going to store it and somebody other wants to uh, use the same data, they, they will again have to take consent from my side, uh, from my wallet. So this should receive a, a railway uh, ticket on my VC. So now I have three VCs. Now, uh, as we have ID, national ID card, vaccination, railway ticket, and same railway ticket can be uh, used. And uh, the um, when we go to a railway station and during a journey, the verification of the railway ticket can be done uh, by a verifier entity. And uh, that can be achieved. Or even uh, airport or, uh, or, or any transport mode we go, verification of the uh, vaccination can be done uh, in this format with an SSI format. So here we, we are not in a position to modify anything in a vaccination certificate. Again, cryptographically verification is done. So there is no scope to modify anything and uh, same verification can be done. So no temp, th this cannot be tempered uh, and they can also verify who is issued and the trust factor will be available across the ecosystem. Now, a quick use case would be passwordless login. In the web two, uh, in the web two context, 
we are now used to enter either username and password to log into a particular system. When you enter a username and password, our password is stored uh, with the third party uh, servers, organizations, uh, and you, you can easily know uh, where we are signing up and who are storing our details. Uh, during the sign up, we are storing our password and everything. And then whenever we want to do a login, uh, we basically enter the password and the, that claim uh, verification or assertion is done on the server side. That's, that's the general uh, username and password we have. We do have some of the uh, modified versions right now, which Anusha mentioned, uh, uh, let's say IDP flow or uh, sign in with Google, sign in with password on some of the social media or any other website. They do not hold it, but actual still it is hold by third party entity. With this use case, now we hold a national ID in our wallet. We should able to prove ourselves with this VC to any on the website. For example, if I want to log into a particular website, uh, they will that website will act as a verifier from that triangle. They should able to ask me the proof and if I'm able to provide the proof successfully, properly, they are able to verify uh, cryptographically, cryptographically, then only they will allow or redirect me to the respective uh, website within uh, within their uh, ecosystem. So let's let's catch on that particular flow. So without entering password uh, credentials or without giving a biometric details to the third party server, I'm still able to authenticate myself uh, on the websites. I'll quickly scan. Uh, so scanning is nothing but uh, scanning is nothing but so these are the information which are getting. Uh, so this particular website is asking me to provide these details, and uh, here we are asking uh, these six uh, five details, but. Uh, even though I have 10 uh, detailed uh, uh, subjects in my VC, uh, they they can ask only for one or two attributes depending on it. For the use case, what we saw, let's say bank uh, account opening, they can out of the complete VC, they can only ask two or three attributes from, uh, from it. If I'm going to, let's say, go for a loan account opening from my bank statement, they should be only able to get the name and range of the salary. If you talk about the zero knowledge proof, concept uh, they will not get the details from my side uh, the exact salary but they will just get the range whether i'm meeting the expectation or meeting the requirement or not i'm just sharing this detail with the uh, any particular verifier which is asking me so the details are shared with me uh, from my side uh, and they are doing a verification uh, behind the scenes of cryptographic and verifiable credentials have been verified uh, again, this this actual institute is checking, uh, fetching the public key from the ledger, checking the issuer's uh, trust factor as well as my VC factor. So if it is successful, uh, I am now logged in with the with the uh, dashboard. And from a demo point of view, we have given this particular dashboard, but it can be implemented to any uh, website uh, they want to. That's it what we wanted to touch upon the demo side and we'll quickly go back here and more or less we are done. Uh, so we have our product from Blockster Lab, uh, credible.id. Uh, so this is a demo what you can also try on your own. Uh, this is the uh, Android uh, app, Adia app. Uh, which is an SSI wallet. This is an iOS uh, iPhone uh, wallet. You can install it and you can try this demo. Uh, there are four use cases right now. You can try these use cases on your own uh, and learn SSI. And if you have any doubts, queries, reach out to us uh, on LinkedIn, email. Uh, we are welcome. We, are, we would be happy to answer your questions or queries. Uh, that's it from our side. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Any questions uh, on, on call or queries?
thank you, uh, Sunit and Anusha for that wonderful session. Uh, so uh, I have one question, like, um, like you mentioned that the self-sovereign identity is working uh, on, uh, I mean, it is used for decentralizing uh, the existing centralized way of uh, storing the identity like Aadhaar. So how, uh, which blockchain are you guys using for the solution? Yeah. So here, Here we are one second. Am I okay? It is not getting equal. So here we are using a hyperledger framework. We are using uh, Aries JavaScript framework on mobile as well as from an organization point of view. That's the uh, underlying uh, layer. Uh, we, are, we are using we are, from a ledger point of view we are using sovereign we have support for sovereign uh, ledger we have support for indice ledger and we also have our own uh, uh, credible uh, test network uh, available so if, if any wants uh, an institute want to have their own managed ledger that indie ledger can also be available and uh, we are also working uh, having an integration with the polygon ledger so all the schema uh, credential definition did documents can also be published on the Polygon Ledger uh, post this integration. So it's purely, uh, mainly right now in Hyperledger framework what we are using. Uh, okay, okay. Th thank you for that uh, explanation. And uh, that's all from our side. So uh, just a wonderful session by uh, Sunit and Anusha. So thank you for joining us here at Trivandrum. And uh, this is us signing off uh, the session and stopping the recording. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.